Odd things to let you guys know about. One, that's better. A couple of odd things this morning. Friday, I went home at lunch and the house was 61 degrees. Now, I'm married to someone who thinks, who takes great pride in not turning on the heaters until Thanksgiving. But that was just too much for me. So I called up our AC guys uh, on Saturday morning. Oh, and I come home on Friday afternoon. She says, the downstairs unit's not working. The screen just goes all black on the thermostat. And I said, oh, I'll give them a call in the morning. Called up my AC guys. They said they can get on out there on today. And they should maybe, they'll maybe be giving us a call at around somewhere between 10 and 12. And I've given them my wife's phone number. Just contact her. I'll be busy. But in case they didn't get that message, I'm going to have to receive that message. And I'll text my wife and let her know they're on their way. So I've got my phone with me. And if you see me having them, it's just something i got to do. Just got to take care of. Because Saturday, uh, to keep, get the downstairs warm, I had to split a bunch of logs that I had not split yet. And you can't really see my hands, but they are all banged up. Because I cannot split wood without busting my knuckles against the bark on the logs. So, but we had a fire going all day Saturday, and it was lovely. Another announcement, if I just turn around and give thank, thanks to Bill All. <laughs> Speaking of heating systems, our heating system is going to be installed in the fellowship hall on Thursday and Friday of this week. Uh, those are two blank days on the calendar, so if you're planning on using the fellowship hall those two days, plan again. It's not going to be available. There will be workers in and around there. So, there is that. What else do we have? There's a number of announcements, of course, in the announcement sheet, no doubt. There's also a yellow sheet of paper, the Remembrance of All Saints, which, since it is All Saints Day today, uh, we will be celebrating that. And, you know, the way this works is... We'll do some liturgy for these nine candles and nine people that have passed away in the past year. But then as Brent starts to play, and we're only singing two verses of For All the Saints, you can come up here and light a candle for a beloved one uh, who has passed away in any time past, not just the past year. Right? So, And to do that, just simply take one of these guys, light it off of it, do that. And then don't try to blow it out. That just throws wax everywhere. Just stick it back in the stick it back in the sand. But we'll sing two verses of that. And Brent, if we still have people in line, Brent will just play through a few more verses. But we won't be singing those ones. Okay. Any other critical announcements to be made? No. All right.
Then let us stand for the remembrance of all saints, that yellow sheet. Oh, we're going to be lighting candles. We're going to need a candle lighter. This isn't good. Does anybody have a light? Is it back in there? Oh, that reminds me. I've got to get my... If it were not for Isma Bolin, this place would fall apart. And you all know that's the truth. Wait, what did I just do with it? Isma, did you hand it to me? The light? I got a light, book of matches. Where? Yeah, I know. What did I do with it? Huh? Oh, yeah, come on up here. What did I just do with it? I'm so glad this is caught on the magic of videotape. This is about showing the people out there that we are professionals. No, no, I need a light. Well, I didn't just lose it in just 30 seconds, did I? I grabbed my... Oh, I was looking for a big trigger lighter. I'm sorry. I had set it down over there, but I was looking for something different. I've got one over there. Believe it or not. Okay. Now. Now we're cooking with gas, as they say. I invite you all to stand as we participate in the remembrance of all saints. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us remember all the saints before God. We praise and bless you, O Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have taught your church that it is an ageless communion of saints. We thank you for gathering those who faithfully waited in hope for the redemption you have promised. And now for adding us who celebrate the love of your Christ for the redemption of the world. Prepare a place among those who are already with you. We name Marion Edwin Bill Hill. Francis Jean Craps Hopkins. Myrna Long. Rob Reynolds.
William David Satterwhite. Linda Unger Yance. Francis Drafts. Milford Drafts. Ivory Tootie Huggins. Help us to remember these and all your holy saints as an encouragement to saintly living, exciting us to love in anticipation of an eternal reunion. Christ says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light.
we continue with our liturgy. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit your people together in one communion in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant us grace to follow your blessed saints in lives of faith and commitment, and to know the inexpressible joys that you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Let's read Psalm 24 responsibly. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who dwell therein. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord and who may stand in God's holy place?
They shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of their salvation. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. A reading from Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe out every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who is seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 11th chapter. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, come, Lord, and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, already greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was laying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because it has been, he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took the stone away, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you that you have for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe in what in, that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I'll use a phrase that you may not have heard before. It's called the cult of the saints. Now, what does that mean? 
That means at the Reformation, there were some problems in the church that needed reforming. And part of it concerned the cult of saints. And because what had been established was really kind of a moneymaker type thing and a way to, you know, they'd, they'd gone and, you know, assigned patronage for all these odd saints. And you were supposed to appeal to them in prayer. And, you know, I mean, it makes sense that, you know, um, I probably St. Thomas is the patron saint of builders because he was a builder of sorts. And, you know, St. Peter is probably the patron saint of those in the fishing industry. That makes sense. But then you remember how the tradition has named the three wise men? It's not in the Bible, mind you, but it's Gaspar and Balthazar and Melchior. Those are the names of the three wise men. Well, for whatever reason, St. Balthazar is the patron saint of the manufacturers of playing cards. That's right, playing cards, like a deck of cards. St. Columbanus is the patron saint of motorcyclists. That must be kind of a new one. And I don't know why St. Columbanus is the patron saint of motorcyclists, but he is. And so the weird things that started happening is that you know people would appeal to these saints uh, to answer their specific prayers. Saint Christopher is the patron saint of lost things. If you lose something and can't find it, you should appeal to Saint Christopher, some would say. And let me tell you, I've told you guys this before, I know I, I used to keep a St. Christopher medal tied to my golf bag, hoping that I would be able to find more balls than I lose. That stuff didn't work. Now, so, so, you know, this is one of the things that was happening at the time of the Reformation and, and the Augsburg Confession, that basic document that describes our faith. So it says, concerning the cult of the saints, they teach that Saints may be remembered in order that we may imitate their faith and good works according to our calling. Thus, the emperor can imitate the example of David in waging war to drive out the Turks from our native land, for both of them are kings. However, scripture does not teach calling on the saints or pleading for help from them, for it sets before us, for it sets, scripture, sets before us, Christ alone as a mediator, atoning sacrifice, high priest, and intercessor. He is to be called upon, and he has promised that our prayers will be heard. Furthermore, he strongly approves this worship most of all, namely that he be called upon in all afflictions. According to 1 John 2, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. End of question. All that other stuff for Luther, by and large for Lutherans, was baloney. And yet we still celebrate All Saints Day. Why is kind of the question. Well, it is that, so that we can remember these people, these nine people today, by name, as the models of godly living. It's not to ask him to ask God a favor for us. Yet we don't even know what the status is. We don't talk about this very often. We don't know really kind of what the status, what happens to the soul. I mean, we know it's an immortal soul, so it's, it, it exists in some way, and it's, it has escaped the treacheries of this world and all the pain and hunger. But we don't really know what happens when a person has died. There's, there's, and 
I tend to be more of a, there's kind of two real options. Right? One is um, something happens that we call soul sleep. And Bishop Eaton talked about this early on in her tenure. Was, you know, that it's more like, remember when you're a little kid and you're going to go on a vacation, maybe to your cousin's house for the weekend or whatever, and they're four hours away, but right after work you guys take off, and then down the road it's getting dark, and you fall asleep. You don't remember the time passing, you just wake up, and you're there at the day of resurrection. Perhaps. And yet, though, we do acknowledge that the souls of the dead are with God in some sort of way. This all kind of started in the understanding of it, kind of started in, in the intermediate world for some types of Jews, early Judaism. And the notion of shale. What was shale? It was just a place of shadows. You can't quite make everything out. And we get some of that in the scriptures, that there's some sort of presence with God. We take the story of Lazarus and the rich man. This is the poor guy. And uh, he's out there. It's a parable that Jesus tells. He's out there. He's dirt poor and... Uh, he would just love to have one of the crumbs that falls off the tables because he's out there in the street and the dogs come and lick at his wounds. Whoa. You know. And then the rich man dresses in purple and eats sumptuous foods every day. And when they both die, Lazarus goes up to the bosom of Abraham. What that means exactly, I can't quite tell you other than it means he's with God. And the rich man is down in hell uh, where there's a great gnashing of teeth and he's, he's hot and he just begs for just, just, hey, hey, send down, send down Lazarus with some water for me to drink. Remember that story? So, you know, that parable. And it's really not about what the afterworld is like. Really, because it's about people being told and not believing. Which is the real problem for Jesus. And then there's martyrs in Revelation that are underneath the tomb, or in the, underneath the altar of a church. They've died, they've been martyred. It would be typical that you would take their remains... Um, what they would do is they would bury someone and then go back and once their body is decomposed, they would take the bones and put them in a container and then bury that under the altar. And in Revelation, they're crying, you know, how long, O oh Lord, this is getting sorted out. How long is this going to take? So they seem to have some sort of presence. And so that's kind of the other view, is that there is an intermediate step between now and the days of re resurrection. And it's certainly comforting to people. I think, I think probably most all of you here believe that. It's, it's, it's plagued with a lot of problems the way it gets commonly interpreted uh, by the popular culture. Several months back I was talking about we had the, the word the scoffers come up in one of our scriptures, and scoffers comes from a word that basically means the babblers, like Tower of Babel. Right? They're talking, they're making noise, but they're not making a lick of sense. And that's what we find a lot of at the time of someone's death, is, you know, the worst is the worst. It's like when a young child dies, and someone tries to offer comfort by saying, God needed another angel in heaven. That's so theologically corrupt, it's, it ought to be criminal. Right? 
First of all, God needs nothing. God doesn't need your prayers. God doesn't need your worship. God lets you worship. God lets you pray. God wants you to pray. But it's for your benefit, not his. God needs nothing. He doesn't, and then, of course, the other thing is, when people die, no one in the Bible does it say they become angels. So they don't get wings. I mean, it's 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 popular idea with things like it's a, it's a wonderful life. You know, like Clarence, he was a person, and then all of a sudden he becomes an angel. He's working himself up the ranks. That sounds like a good system, doesn't it? You die expecting eternal life, and it's just going to be one more climb up a ladder? Oh, maybe I can make next age a level. No. no. But we don't, we don't understand because we don't understand death in and of itself. It's certain. You know, and, and we have in our gospel lesson today... You know, Mary comes, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. Anyone familiar with the, the grief work of Catherine kubler Walsh, who became kind of an expert on grief in the night? And this is where we get the, the idea of grief moving through in phases or steps of grief. You know, and uh, denial, and, and then there's one called bargaining, is one of those things. This seems to me what Mary is suffering from. And this is, of course, this is not Mary, Jesus' mother. This is Mary, brother or sister to Lazarus and to Martha. Mary and Martha who live in Bethany and are good friends of Jesus. Every time Jesus is in Jerusalem and he needs, in, in the book of John, he needs to get away, he cuts out to Bethany. That's, that's where he feels like he's got a home. That's where he can spend time with people and just hang out. Yes, he'll teach as well, but he'll also just sit down at a table and enjoy food, laughter with friends. And so Mary's going through this kind of bargaining. Jesus, if you had been here. She's upset. She's grieving. When she's upset... Jesus begins to cry. It's that famous John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. Did any of you ever have to memorize Bible passages as punishment? That was one you could always pull out real quick. John eleven thirty five. Jesus wept. Right, but why is Jesus weeping? Well, you have to understand that we're going to see Jesus as both a human and divine. Lazarus was a friend. Now he's gone. And he's left behind grieving sisters, grieving friends. And Jesus seems to be crying because he feels bad for Mary and Martha. And certainly who wouldn't? and feels probably bad for himself. He's not at that moment thinking about the resurrection. What he knows, though, is that all these people that are grieving, what they need is a good dose of faith. Now, in the passage right before this one is the one where he, she says, I know I'm going to see him again on the re resurrect, day of resurrection. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection, the truth, and the life. To which I've always thought, that's really not much of an answer, Jesus. That doesn't make a lick of sense. It would hardly seem to be common sense way to respond. 
We're not always going to figure Jesus out, are we? But he does know that what all of those there need is faith. They need someone to believe in. And they need them to believe that the Father has sent Jesus the Son. And so in one of his great signs then, he points his face to heaven and says right then and there, I'm doing this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that you may believe that you sent me. They may believe you sent me. And then, of course, he raises Lazarus. And so it's a, he's trying to boost their faith because he believes, he knows faith to be a great, a great antidote to their grief. You know, you can you certainly, when we lose a loved one, it hurts, and we're going to miss them. But what helps us to get through it is the realization that they've just moved on in another way to be closer to God. And that should bring us a modicum of comfort, if not joy. It was at the funeral for Beverly Nivens. No, not Beverly Nivens, I'm sorry, Beverly. <laughs> yeah, no, is at the funeral for Barbara Nivens, Steve's mom. That Emily Edenfield, who was pastor out there at Wittenberg Lutheran, a person I've had a great deal of respect for for a long time, she's now assistant to the bishop gave one of the best funeral sermons I'd ever heard in my entire life. Right. And it was 1 Corinthians 13. And I know you're thinking, what? The wedding passage? Because that's what I thought. But she ended up the sermon saying, look, and these three remain, these three gifts that Paul is talking about. Faith, hope, and love. They're gifts because they're given to us, right? They're given to us by God. A place to have faith in, a hope of our future. And then she said, and then Paul writes, but the greatest of these is love. And why is love the greatest? Well, because on the day of resurrection, we will no longer need hope. Everything we would have ever hoped for will be accomplished. We will need, no longer need faith. We will be right there in the very presence of God. The only thing we need to do is to give back to God, to give one another, those in the communion of saints that are joined with us. At that point, we're all just there to love. We don't know exactly what happens between the point of death and the point of resurrection. But it's well, well spelled out what happens on that day of resurrection. That's our faith. That's our hope. Thanks be to God. Oh, our next hymn. I want to be sure to get this right. Hold on. Our next hymn is Shall We Gather at the River? We're going to sing verses 1 and 4.
Remain standing as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Eternal God, we hold firm amid the changes of this world. Hear us now as we pray for the church, the world, and all people in need. You may kneel as able. Merciful God, we give thanks for all missionaries who have brought your message of hope to new communities and wiped tears away. Especially John Christian Frederick Heyer, Bartholomew Ziegenbog, Ludwig Nomensen, whom we commemorate today. Continue to raise up courageous missionaries to serve your gospel of hope. Hear us, O God. Creating God, we praise you for abundant harvests and for the goodness of creation. Create communities of care for your earth so that all lands, water, soil will be celebrated and cherished by future generations of saints. Hear us, O God. God of peace, we give you thanks for the nations of peace that serve as a refu refuge for all those whose homelands are afflicted with violence. Strengthen those who work to the, who continue to work for priests and support all veterans who carry with them the scars of war as we honor them this week with Veterans Day. Hear us, O God. God of healing, we give you thanks for healthcare workers who labor around the clock to answer cries for help. Bring wholeness to all who struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, addiction, and all who long for healing in any sort of way, especially those we now name aloud in our hearts or on our lips. Hear us, O oh God. God of the ages, we give you thanks for the saints of this congregation who have inspired, challenged, loved, and taught us. Those who have died this past year and those who have died in years previous. Wipe away our tears and lead us by their example until we feast together on the holy mountain. Hear us, O God. God, our protection and strength, we remain to you, we entrust to you all for whom we pray. Remain with us always through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please share God's peace from a socially responsible distance.
the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should in all times or in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. By the witnesses of the saints, you show us the hope of our calling, and strengthen us to run the race set before us, that we may delight in your mercy, and rejoice with him in glory. And so with all the saints, with the choirs of angels and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night when she was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is kingdom, and power, and the glory, forever and ever. God invites you to this table of bounty. Come, the banquet is ready. Why did Christ give for you? Christ give for you.
Please rise. Now, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you unto eternal life. Let us pray together. O oh God, in this holy communion, you have welcomed us into your presence, nourished us with words of mercy, and fed us at your table. Mirror the cares of this life. Strengthen us to love you with all our heart, serving our neighbors with a willing spirit, and honor the earth you have made. Through Christ our Lord. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Our final hymn is Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. We are singing three verses, verses 1, 5, and 6. to love and serve the Lord.
about those ones.